Audiobook title, Mix Audiobook Collection 003. Solis, An Isoke Adventure by Rowan. Chapter 45 Meeting with Royalty. Ah, yes, and an honor to meet you to your majesties. I said kneeling down, although I was still confused by the appearance of the king, I simply tried not to think about it too much. My goodness, just as EMI said you are well versed in etiquette. Commented the queen, I was a little curious to hear that EMI was talking about me to the others but decided that now was not the time nor the moment to ask questions. You didn't have to be so formal today, Ren, today we are not here as king and queen but as two parents welcoming a friend of our daughter. Said the king as he took a cup of tea, hearing the king's words, I stood up and thanked him for the consideration. Thank you for the consideration. I said with a soft smile on my face. Anyway, come and sit down, we have tea and cookies so you can eat as much as you like. Said the queen with a smile on her face, for some reason her smile made me feel at ease, it was a little strange but since it helped me relax, I wasn't going to complain, after that I walked over to one of the available chairs and sat down, as soon as I sat down a waitress who was present approached me and poured the tea into my cup, taking one of the cookies as moderately and with manners. So, Ren, how is your store going, I hope it is paying off as usual. The first to start the conversation was the king, hearing his question I decided I would probably have no problem telling him. We are doing well, thanks to all my employees and our ear my store is able to maintain itself even if I am not present so we are thinking of putting into practice one of my ideas, I honestly don't know how to thank you all for the help you give me. I said sipping my tea right away, after that we continued to talk about various subjects, the queen whenever she could asked me questions about my family and other things, in general it was quite nice, minutes later the door was opened again and the last guest had finally arrived, as soon as the door opened EMI entered gracefully, she was wearing a beautiful white dress, it looked quite comfortable on her, on her feet there were two extremely cute snickers, her hair was arranged with a beautiful white flower, her I had to sum it up in words it looked like an angel had descended to the mortal world. EMI, you have finally arrived. I was snapped out of my days by the queen who called out to EMI. Sorry for the delay mother, it took longer than expected to get me ready. Said EMI as she walked towards us, as soon as she approached, she sat down on the vacant chair that was next to me. My heart is probably beating extremely fast right now, I hope she doesn't hear. My thoughts were disorganized, EMI's look was what I was least expecting, she was probably the most beautiful girl I had ever seen counting in two lifetimes. So, how is school life going for you too? King asked, this time I kept quiet waiting for EMI to speak. It's going well dad, both Ren and I have been chosen to give the admissions speech. EMI said. Since when do you guys call each other by names? Asked the queen with doubt on her face. We are classmates, isn't it normal that we call each other by our names? Said EMI calmly, she really seemed to have an answer for every question. By the way, what kind of project are you guys planning to do, I'm really curious about it. Asked the king as he looked at me, hearing this both the queen and EMI seemed to be interested in the subject as well. Well. It's kind of complicated to put into words, if possible, could you guys give me a piece of paper and a pen, it would be easier if I put the main points. I asked a little anxiously, I really didn't know if they would accept my request, not to mention that it was rude for a commoner to ask for something from the king and queen. No problem. Saying this the king gestured to one of the maids and she soon started walking out of the garden, a few minutes later she returned with a relatively large piece of paper and a pen, after this I started to elaborate on the whole process of them all and how it would work and what would be sold, about the sections and about the floors, obviously, I was omitting the most important parts of the project, not that I didn't trust them but you never know, a spy could be among the servants. Well, this is the project I have in mind. Saying this I brought the sheet closer to the table so that everyone could see it, after a few seconds their expressions changed several times, to be honest it was quite funny to see their expressions, as in this world a concept of something like shopping would be a bit far away for them this must be something revolutionary in terms of commerce. This really is a fantastic idea, it really could only come from you. 
said the king with a cocky smile on his face. Suddenly I feel like he is bragging about his son but it's probably just in my head. So, about the candy what exactly are you thinking of doing? Asked the queen strangely excited. Is she a candy lover? I wondered as I saw the sudden change in her attitude. Normally she seems calm and gentle but now she is totally excited about the idea. Well, I don't know yet. I have some ideas but I will need to do some tests first. I said as I looked at EMI. She also looked strangely anxious. I wonder if she likes candy too? With that in mind I launched a proposal to the royal family. Um. I wonder if you guys would like to taste them when I make them? Hearing my words, the queen's eyes sparkled as EMI seemed a little more excited than usual. Are you sure? The queen asked. Sure, I don't mind. I said with a smile on my face, although, that wasn't the only reason. If royalty tastes and like it will have a better chance for other people to try it. System vs. Rebirth. Chapter 762 Confrontation. Who? I shouldn't get too worked up. I am supposed to be older than Noel right now, Anna took a deep breath, trying to calm her heart down. I don't know why but whenever I argue with this guy, I can't help but get a bit too excited. I should act more mature. It's probably because I have been too emotionless in the past due to the brainwashing that I haven't got the chance to let go of all my pent-up emotion. And only by bickering like this can I let go of all my frustration. No, no. Why did I make an excuse? I simply have to act like my age, Anna tried to calm down, but whenever she saw Noel's calm and collected face made her feel slightly annoyed. Noel was supposed to be younger than her, but because of her competitiveness, she thought of his maturity as a little competition in her heart. She had been like this a lot of times whenever she was with Noel. How do I put this in words? I feel like I can become my true self when I'm with him like this. Anne had changed a lot from the past her. And Noel was the one who brought that change. It might be because of it that she trusted Noel so much that it was fine to let him see this side of her. Anna let out a long sigh thinking this had gotten a bit out of control. Meanwhile, Noel also had his own thoughts about her. I hated her in the past. I hated her for trying to kill my parents and even almost killed me. But when she told me about that alternate world, I couldn't help but wonder what the other me thought about her. She must have been horrible and killed a lot of people. Yet, she told me that the other me tried to help her. Why? I couldn't understand what the other me thought of her. However, I do admit that she is special. My talent was bad before I met Ardagon. Only thanks to Ardagon could I reach this level. On the one hand, my inferiority might be the one causing me to be agitated whenever I bickered with her. On the other hand, I think I've lost all that hatred. She might have been horrible in the past, but the current her is extremely different. She is. It felt like a coincidence that before Noel could think of an answer, Anna actually asked, say, Noel, if you receive the chance to peek into the alternate world, what would you do? Hum. Noel tilted his head in confusion. Do you mean if I have the chance to be like you? Yes. Anna nodded. Noel thought for a moment and said, I don't really care about that. Ha. Anna was startled by the answer. Why? If you got this kind of knowledge, wouldn't that give you a chance to reverse everything and even create a future you desire? Is that so? That sounds tempting. Noel nodded in understanding. Then, Noel waved his hand, stopping her. Listen to this story. There is a son who kills his father. That son is being condemned by the whole village. Do you think the son is a bad guy or not? If he can choose to return to the past and fix his mistake, will he do it? That's obvious. He should return to the past. This way, he won't be condemned by the whole village and won't have to bear the mistake. In that case, what if the son kills the father because the latter is beating him and his mother every single day? And that murder is only the reaction of the boy to survive and protect his beloved mother? That's... Anna looked down, not being able to answer. I have made a lot of mistakes in the past. Just thinking about it makes me so embarrassed that I want to dig a hole to hide. However, that's what defines me. My past has created the current me, and my future is the one that shapes my path. 
Noel pointed at himself while smiling. But the present me is the one making a decision. Whether it's right or not, I will make a decision where I will continue to move on. There will surely be some regrets, but I'm not going to run away. Not running away? Anna contemplated. It felt like Noel was saying she had been running away from her mistake. But this chance was actually given by him as if he wanted her to do just that. This made her confused. She recalled the story and tried to change it a bit. In that case, how about after killing the father, the boy ends up regretting it? However, no matter what he does, he won't be able to bring back his father. The only thing he can do is to atone for his mistake. He continued working hard for the next ten years and solved all kinds of disasters. Do you think the boy has atoned for his sins? Noel shook his head, answering it with another question. If I said yes, would the boy stop solving the disasters? That's... Anna fell silent. If the boy stopped, the disasters would strike and cause more misery. What I hate is the boy who kills his father. However, what I like is the boy who solves numerous disasters. Sin is sin, merit is merit. It won't be washed away no matter what you do. That's why if I truly can reject that chance, then I would rather not go through it. If people will come for my life, then I shall confront them head on. If people will come to thank me, then I shall welcome them with a hug. Exclamation point, Anna widened her eyes in shock. All the people she killed in the past would continue to haunt her. Even if she returned to the past, that memory would continue to linger in her mind. She had been changing the future for the better. But as he said, would she stop if he acknowledged her deeds? What Noel gave her was not the chance to redo her life and fix her mistakes. Instead, he gave her the opportunity to do what her past life couldn't do. They were not the same. And the question was, what could she do? What made Noel give that chance to her? In other words, the reasons why she had this chance, the only thing she could do. It would be a hard path for her, but she had to find it. Anna couldn't help but smile. A truce. Peace agreement. Noel smiled back. Chapter 763 Not Noel and Anna continued working on their control. Now that they had reached an agreement, they began to observe each other and explain what they found. Anna found multiple mistakes in Noel's control and fixed them for him. Meanwhile, Noel also had his own different perspective that even Anna just figured out. Instead of fighting against each other, they ended up working together to hasten their progress. However, Noel still couldn't forget how Anna expressed her concern. It seemed that Anna thought her life in the alternate world was real, impacting her behavior. The Noel in that world should have done a lot for her as if trying to change her. In the end, they couldn't achieve anything before getting betrayed. It seemed that Anna was burdened by the fact that she killed a lot of people in that world. Most of those people didn't deserve death. Hence, when Anna received all that memory, her mind underwent an abrupt change. She realized that she had done everything wrong and tried to fix it to atone for her sins. And one of the objectives should be changing him so that they don't have to fight anymore and end up getting betrayed. He completely understood her concern. And all the pieces of information she had revealed were quite similar to that alternate world. Noel couldn't help but feel a bit curious regarding this matter. On the one hand, Anna considered it an alternate world. On the other hand, she spoke like she had completely experienced that world. Of course, he understood that receiving a memory of that world, especially if that memory came from birth to her death, would definitely feel real and affect her personality. But Noel felt like this matter wasn't as simple as that. Noel occasionally took a peek at her, thinking about this matter. Like how Anna believed that they could go further if they joined hands, Noel also recognized that the only one who could probably stand beside him on that path was Anna. This made him in a dilemma. Noel considered Anna his friend, or even more than just a friend. However, Noel still couldn't see Anna romantically despite spouting everything regarding his woman, marriage, and so on. In fact, this was also the reason why he never thought much about other women in his life. He had certainly overcome his trauma, but if he thought about the continuation of the Ardigan family, he couldn't help but think about the effect of Ardigan. As he learned from Ardigan, 
he wouldn't be able to produce more than one heir. In addition, his goal would definitely cause his wife to be sad. Hence, he had to be careful when he picked someone to be his wife. Still, there was something bothering him. The Noel from that alternate world seemed to be doing his best to change Anna. It felt like the Noel in that world wished to mend their relationship and eventually work together. So, Noel couldn't help but wonder if the Noel in that world had fallen for Anna. Whenever he thought about it, he could only pinch the bridge of his nose, feeling troubled by that thought. And due to this thought, his progress became a bit slower. On the other hand, Anna had resolved one of the biggest hurdles in her heart, causing her to tackle the current training with a clear mind. Horizontal ellipsis. Two days later, Anna opened her eyes right before sunset. When she looked at her hands and moved to her entire body, she realized that she had done it. She had managed to create an outer layer that looked like skin all around her body. However, her control could only maintain it for three seconds before it disappeared. Comma, Anna fell silent while taking a glance at Noel. Noel had covered his body, but his head still looked like a helmet. If this continued, he should be able to achieve it right before they fell asleep. However, looking at his progress ended up making her feel slightly ashamed. After all, Noel was the reason why she managed to clear this hurdle so quickly. In the end, Anna closed her eyes once again. This time, she enveloped her body and inflated the head so that it looked like she hadn't completed her training. It seemed that she was planning to make it look like she had lost this battle to thank Noel for the answer. Old Rue might not be around them, but Damien, Dimitri, and Nicole were watching them the whole time, including how Anna behaved. Ha! Why did Anna do something like that? Nicole frowned. Can't you see that she is in love with him? Damien smirked. If I'm not wrong, Anna and Master often make a little competition. It seems that Anna is planning to let Master win. Dimitri frowned. I don't know what happens between each other, but their relationship has become weirder ever since we reached that camping site. Hum. Nicole scratched the back of her head. I thought that Anna hated the Ardigan family to the bone and wanted to eliminate them to remove future threats. That was what I thought as well to the point where I wanted to humble her. But she had definitely changed. Dimitri shook his head helplessly, remembering the fights they had in the past. Don't you think something will happen since they are sleeping in the same room? Damien smirked, teasing Nicole and Dimitri since they were Anna and Noel's guardians. Surprisingly, Nicole didn't give any reaction as if she had given her approval. Noel had two spirits and was the heir of the Ardigan family. So, there was no objection from her, especially after seeing Noel was this capable. As for Dimitri, he claimed, those two actually joined their beds together. How did you know? I'm a butler, you remember? I thought about tidying up their beds and cleaning up their room. But once I saw it, I couldn't help but nail those beds together so that they couldn't separate anymore. Dimitri looked calm and collected, but Nicole and Damien could sense that he was proud of it. Epic of Ice Dragon, Reborn is an Ice Dragon with a System. Chapter 1385 Endlessly Burning Flames vs Endlessly Regenerating Body The Flame Emperor was overwhelmed, his body being struck four times by gigantic divine weapons, ice, shadows, water, and flames of beginning divinities wrapping around his body, constantly piercing through his divine barriers and divine armor. ra -ra. With a furious, wrathful roar, the Flame Emperor opened his eyes, black flames surging from within. With his roar came an explosion of the flames of the end, so powerful that all four of Drake's weapons were pushed away. Through Ulam, a titanic pillar of black flames emerged before Drake, his dozens of eyes spread across his many heads glanced at the monstrous presence with fascination. Not bad. Drake laughed. His four weapons overflowing with his divinities and their own divinities, converging together with his newest technique, gaining draconic power. Flourash. Drake instantly leaped into battle again, swinging his four weapons with his gigantic, muscular dragon arms as his draconic aura kept erupting from his body. Dragon King's Divine Weapon Arts, 1000 Divine Strikes. Clash. 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 Crash. 
1,000 strikes were unleashed in just a split of a second, each one capable of devastating half a mountain. The strikes were, however, blocked by an enormous wave of black flames. Infernal abyss wave. Boom. An explosion of divinities erupted, the surroundings shook once more against the battle between incredibly powerful gods. You're not half bad, old man. Drake smiled at the Flame Emperor. I underestimated you a bit. The Flame Emperor laughed. But that's going to change now. Both clashed, flames of the end against a wave of rainbow energy, combining countless divinities together. Drake prepared yet another surprise, channeling the divine abilities he had acquired by devouring the vampire venerable and becoming a vampire dragon himself. Primordial Blood Lord. Abyssal Shadow World. Drake roared, channeling the two divine abilities in combination with their related divinities. Absolute Abyssal Blood World. Through Odom. Ha! The Flame Emperor was once more shaken. His entire body was suddenly swallowed by an ever-growing domain that Drake conjured with no effort at all, until he found himself trapped within a pocket dimension, where the only thing he could see was darkness, seas of blood, and hundreds of draconic red eyes glaring at him. T this power. The Vampire Venerable's Blood Lord and Shadow World Divine Abilities. Asked the Flame Emperor, as a soul fragment of Oberon, he knew very well about the strengths of one of the strongest Venerables of Yggdrasil. However, he quickly realized they weren't the same, it was a much stronger ability, combining the two with draconic energy and other divinities. No. This is much stronger. He muttered, coating his entire body with flames of the end, shaped like a huge armor. Abyssal flames of the end armor. Let's see if you can tang this. Drake's voice echoed monstrously across the world the flame emperor was confined within, the blood sea beneath him quickly started to move fusing with the endless darkness, the eyes, everything. Thousands of tentacles emerged, and hundreds of monstrous dragon heads made of shadows and blood, roaring ferociously. They constantly attacked the Flame Emperor, taking bites off his armor and even devouring his own divine aura, weakening him for a bit. The Flame Emperor did not thought that Drake could have inherited the powers of someone completely unrelated to him. Not even Greenwoods knew that Drake had become a vampire dragon like Sanger anyways, so naturally, this took him by surprise. Crash. 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 Grah. The Flame Emperor furiously fought back against the thousands of tentacles and hundreds of dragon heads, beams of red energy, spears and swords made of divine blood, chains of divine sealing darkness, and everything else. Explosions of his black flames continued to spread across the world, as Drake smiled from outside, pointing one of his huge dragon hands into the world and beginning to compress it as he closed his fists, channeling his void and space magic affinities. World compression. Through him. Through him. Through him. Around the flame emperor, the world that had trapped him inside began to compress constantly, his entire divine power being compressed as well as he started to feel space itself trying to crush him beneath its invisible weight. This. Can't. Stop me. However, with a prideful roar, the Flame Emperor's black flames erupted, his entire body started to grow in size. As countless black tattoos spread across his body, the two red orb fragments he held within his hands glowed brightly, imbuing him with their primordial powers. Space rendering black flame sword, Graham. With a prideful roar, he channeled the red orb fragments element of space, combining it with his black flames and materializing them together into a divine sword, cutting through the distorting miniature world and escaping in time. Slayer Ash. Boom. With a miniature world exploding behind him, the Flame Emperor rushed outside, his horns growing larger and more demon-like as he clashed against Drake right away. Well, that was quick. Drake instantly received his barrage of slashing, space rendering blows with a different time of element, their total opposites, in fact, water and time. He didn't need a gear to use such elements, as he had acquired both divinities for them and also high affinities, merely combining them with divine abilities would unleash a devastating effect, even more with a compatible weapon in aerial right there with him. Ruler of the Seas. Divine Holy Metal Creation. Drake Lord. Channeling the divine abilities powers. Ariel. On it. 
Ariel activated her own abilities, which she had plenty, combining them with Drake's right before the Flame Emperor's barrage of attacks were to hit. Flyer Ash. Ariel's entire body transformed, absorbing Drake's powers as she grew in size even more, glowing with a mighty golden metal as rainbow ice covered her body, the other weapons quickly fusing into her body like Drake had done before to kill the Deep One. Divine Sea Dragon Ruler's Mighty Fangs. With a fast and powerful swing of his divine fused weapon, Drake intercepted the furious Flame Emperor's Gram Sword, as countless currents of divine seas splashed over his flames, slowly turning them off and weakening them, not through water alone, but with the power of time imbued into them. Crash. 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 This water's no ordinary divinity. The Flame Emperor realized. He's slightly manipulating time. Walker of the Worlds. Chapter 1743A began to attract. Waves of energy were rolling off the Great Shield, as the combined attack continued its assault. And yet, Lin Mu didn't look to be moving at all. 1. His foes in the distance were also watching it all, shock evident in their eyes. The fourth tribulation stage in mortal man's hands were trembling as he held the glass sword weakly. It can't be. How can it be halted? The man was dumbstruck. The third tribulation stage immortal woman wasn't that much different either, her lips turning into a thin line while strain was visible on her forehead. Her fingers were also trembling, as she tried to maintain control over her talisman formation. We might have been mistaken. She said after a minute had passed and Lin Mu hadn't moved at all. Their attacks were still trying to push back but the Great Shield was still holding on. Senior brother, if this doesn't work, it seems like we'll have to forfeit. The woman spoke as she thought about the potential outcomes. Don't say that. The result is still not decided. The fourth tribulation stage immortal man was not ready to give up yet. I can feel my control weakening. The attack might not last much longer. The woman replied. The fourth tribulation stage immortal man could only grit his teeth upon hearing that, and gripped the glass sword tightly. As much as he wanted to continue lightning, deep down he also knew that he might not be able to last that long. My immortal key is already low, and junior sister is also running out of her talismans. The current attack also consumed most of her immortal key in one go, the man thought to himself. Rumble. But he was quickly brought out of his thoughts by a change in the situation. What in the? The fourth tribulation stage immortal man gazed at their combined attack that was now shifting. It's splitting. The woman muttered in shock. Rumble. The man and woman watched with trembling eyes as the combined attack split into three. One segment went to the left of the great shield, one went to the right of the shield, while one was deflected to the top of the great shield. W -o, 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 o The sound of a strong gust was heard, as the attack tore the very air apart. And yet despite all this, the great shield was still standing strong. Tremble. Crack crack crack. The effect of the attack was now being exerted on its surroundings though. The ground was unearthed, as two large gullies formed around the shield. The gullies formed a large V-shape and extended for nearly 500 meters before they narrowed until turning into mere cracked lines. As for the segment of the attack that was deflected off the top, it simply went into the sky for about a kilometer before fading away. Still, the segment that went into the sky acted like a beacon. It could be seen from very far, and all those that saw it knew that a large conflict was happening there. The energy fluctuations coming from it might alarm a few, but they might still come to check it out eventually. It wasn't a matter of if, but a matter of when. At the very least for now, they'll wait and watch, until the energy waves fade away and they can take a proper look at the entire situation. Being wary at this point in the tournament was necessary after all. Or they might not be able to survive this. The ones that were left now were all strong contenders, and the conflict that seemed to be going on was between some of the top ones, or so they thought. They didn't know that the ones that were fighting were a pair of third tribulation stage immortal woman and a fourth tribulation stage immortal man against Lin Mu who was at the second tribulation stage of the immortal realm. Normally it was not a matchup that should have happened, or even lasted for this long. 
but now it was happening and was creating such a massive phenomena. Sure. A few seconds later, the combined attack finally faded away. The cannonball made out of runes turned into mere wisps of ki that couldn't sustain themselves while the sword light faded away into nothingness. Rumble. The great shield shifted due to its weight, after the force acting on it was removed. Crack. It sank further into the ground, and made the gullies on its sides collapsed further. The integrity of the ground had been weakened from the attack and it could actually not bear the weight of the shield any longer. H.U. Thankfully, Lin Mu acted quickly and stopped the aspect of heaviness. Sure. The great shield returned to its normal weight, which was still pretty great. But now, Lin Mu could control it as he wanted and made it float above him. Are you two okay? Lin Mu asked his companions. I'm. I'm fine. Ming Aeolian responded, still a bit shaken. Me too. Ming Dandan replied, feeling awestruck by it all. Good. Lin Mu said letting out a breath. Whoosh. He quickly flew over to the pair, finding them to be unmoving. Lin his immortal sense scanned over the area again, quickly spotting their opponents. Let me get rid of the foes before we do anything. Lin Mu said before flying up. Be careful there might be others coming. Whoosh. He quickly flew over to the pair, finding them to be unmoving. Lin Mu was expecting them to attack him again, but surprisingly they didn't. Instead they just looked at him a mix of fear and awe in their eyes. May we know your name? The man asked. Daoist Mulin. Lin Mu replied. So it is Daoist Mulin. Seems like we've faced the end of our journey here. The man said with a self-depreciating chuckle. If anything, you two fought well. You two are certainly strong. Lin Mi replied calmly seeing that the two had admitted defeat. Though it makes me feel amazed about the strength of the Serene Glass Valley. Chapter 1744 An Invitation from Former Foes The pair from the Serene Glass Valley had originally thought to struggle till the end. But after seeing Lin Mi's abilities they decided against it. Instead, they chose to lose the battle honorably. 1. But before that, the two hoped to talk with Lin Mu a little. At the very least, they wished to get acquainted with him. After all, Lin Mu seemed to be a second tribulation stage immortal on the outside. There weren't many cultivators like this that could battle a pair of fourth tribulation stage immortal and a third tribulation stage immortal like this and defeat them. Thus they at least wanted to get to know such a capable person. Even if Lin Mu might have been assisted by another cultivator and a beast, it still didn't change the fact that he was the one who had blocked their combined attack. If they couldn't fulfill their elders' wishes themselves, they could at least have a strong immortal as an acquaintance. After all, having more acquaintances was better than enemies. And their battle wasn't one to the death and neither was out of enmity. It was just a competition. At first, they weren't even sure whether Lin Mu would talk to them or not. They also expected him to attack right away and wipe them out. It was something that was understandable and was something they might have done too. But after thinking it over, they had decided to try talking to him. And when they did the pair were surprised to hear Lin Mu's words. You know about us? The third tribulation stage immortal woman asked in surprise. Yes, the crest. Lin Mu pointed. It is of the Serene Glass Valley, is it not? He spoke. Daoist Mulin is correct. The man replied. I am Shu Jingju of the Serene Glass Valley. He introduced himself. And I'm Shu Jing Ming's Hu. The woman replied as well. I'll remember you too. Your strengths are also good. Your tally's manic formations in particular are impressive. I can see you've worked towards optimizing the efficiency of immortal key consumption. Lin Mu said, much to their surprise. You could tell. Xu Jing Ming who asked about the compliment. While there were many that complimented her ability with formations, it wasn't every day that she could hear someone compliment her characteristics about it. Only those that are well versed with formations would even be able to tell that. This means, Xu Jing Ming who looked at Lin Mu with intrigue. I am a formation master myself. Lin Mi replied. So you really are. And yet you used key skills and your sword for a battle against us, Xu Jing Ming who said in a confused tone. Well, my path in the formations is a bit different. 
Lin Mu said before letting out the aura of his Deo embryo. Sure. The complex aura of the rune shaping brush Deo embryo was spread out, allowing both Xu Jing Ming's Hu and Xu Jing Ju to feel it. While only Xu Jing Ming's Hu was a formation master among the two, it didn't mean that Xu Jing Ju was not knowledgeable about them. Having lived in the Serene Glass Valley all his life, he knew several formation masters and had learned some too. This aura. It's almost the same as Second Elder, Xu Jing Ju was surprised. Dare traces? Xu Jing Ming Hu was stunned. No, wait. You're taking the path of the formations as a Dao. She quickly recognized. Perhaps. Lin Yu didn't reveal anything. But that alone was enough for Xu Jing Ming Hu to get excited. You have to come to Serene Glass Valley. She suddenly said before taking out an identity tablet. Please take this. She held it out. Ha! Lin Mu was confused by her actions. The woman's senior brother was also surprised, especially when he saw the tablet. Junior sister, are you sure? Xu Jingju asked with concern. Yes. I think Daoist Mu Lin can assist the elder. Xu Jing Ming Hu said with confidence. Very well. Daoist Mu Lin would you give us the honor of being our guest? Xu Jingju asked. Um. Lin Mu didn't expect to be given an invitation all of a sudden like this. Of course, this is not immediate. You can come when the tournament is done. I assure you the Serene Glass Valley will welcome you honorably. Xu Jing Ming Hu tried to convince him. Hum, alright. Lin Mu decided to take it. Maybe I'll get to see more of their weapons and formations, he thought. The glass weapons that Xu Jing Ju had used were made using a method that Lin Mu didn't know about. As for the talismanic formations that Xu Jing Ming Hu was using, it was rather unique too. Plus having heard that the Serene Glass Valley had made peak grade immortal weapon for the Dao Wind Empire, Lin Mu also get a desire to see just what they were like. Thank you for accepting. The pair of man and woman said. I don't know when exactly I might come after the tournament, though. Lin Mu stated. It is fine. You can take your time. Xu Jing Ming Zhu replied. Okay then. Lin Mu said, before sensing a few presences that were getting close. As much as I'd like to talk more, I think there are a few guests arriving soon. Of course, Xu Jing Ju nodded. Our defeat is long due. The man said before taking out his token. Xu Jing Ming Zhu did the same before both of them shattered it in their hands. Crack crack. Is everything alright, brother Mu Lin? Ming Aeolian asked through the communication jade slip. I hope to see you soon, Xu Jing Ming Zhu said before turning into a flash of light. Xu Jing Ju disappeared as well, leaving Lin Mu alone for the time being. Is everything alright, brother Mu Lin? Ming Aeolian asked through the communication jade slip. Yes, everything is fine. Lin Mu replied. What were you doing? Ming Dandan questioned. Were you talking to them? Yeah. I seem to have gotten an invitation. Lin Mu gazed at the identity token in his hand. One side of the token had the name of Xu Jing Ming Zhu, and the other side had the name Serene Glass Valley imprinted on it. You were invited? Both Ming Aeolian and Ming Dandan were surprised to hear that. I didn't expect it either. Lin Mu shook his head. Though what we can expect now is several immortals coming our way. He quickly added. Lin Mu's conventions with Xu Jing Ming Hu and Xu Jing Ju hadn't taken more than three minutes, and yet it was enough for a few daring immortals to come closer. They were still about five kilometers away, but Lin Mu could still sense them. Some of the tried to hide in the topography, while some were using items or skills to do the same. After all, these were all cultivators who had survived for over three weeks now. They hadn't done that by sheer luck. They had done it by taking caution. Even if they had strength, they could still be ambushed by overwhelming numbers. Thus it was better for them to be careful. But a Lin Mu, their locations were easily exposed. Though some can hide their cultivation bases well enough, Lin Mu thought to himself. How many are coming? Ming Aeolian asked next. At least ten. Lin Mu furrowed his brows as he counted their numbers. Six at the fourth tribulation stage of the immortal realm, the rest at the third tribulation stage of the immortal realm. He observed. Hearing this, the eyes of the Ming sisters went wide. 
Should we get ready for combat? They asked. Yes. I think it is time to gather up now. The attack earlier was basically a beacon. Everyone should have seen it and they'll be heading to check. Lin Mu knew they would have to change up their plans of ambushing. All right. But the Ming sisters were not discouraged. After all they knew that this was something that was bound to happen. They had been prepared to fight outright from the start anyways. Lin Mu's plans had only allowed them to conserve their strength so that they could last longer. Not just that, but he had also allowed their beasts to be healed and save their energies. Now that a true battle was approaching, there was no way they would back down. Especially after seeing Lin Mu block a great attack for them, they felt a fire within them. They felt that they were lacking and needed to be stronger than they were. With all the help that they had been given, they felt like they had let down Lin Mu with how they had performed. Lu Su, Qi and Wen, get ready. It's time for the true all-out battle. Lin Mu also informed the others. We're already prepared. Lu Su said with confidence. Gather up. We'll give them a little surprise. Lin Mu said, before taking out a few items. Lu Su and Qian Wen quickly flew over to his position while the Ming sisters checked on their tamed beasts. Lin Mu on the other hand, was setting up a few formation components. It should help us fight better, he thought to himself. Dragon Monarch System, 393-397, by Dark Bangali. Chapter 393-393, Crimson Warlock vs. Dark Mage Sorcerer, I. I have lived for more than seven centuries. It had taken me seven centuries to build a current Echo Nexus Empire. You might be more powerful than me, but I am more knowledgeable than you. Aditya secretly rolled his eyes. He wanted a straight answer. And he was talking about his life. Aditya wasn't the slightest bit interested in knowing about his life. In my long life, I was fortunate enough to find the corpses of some beings that do not originate from this realm. It took a long time but I finally succeeded. Through numbers trails and errors, I have become a hybrid hell monster. Hybrid hell monster? What's that supposed to be? Hearing this Lucas was left speechless. Then he remembered that Aditya was only 19 years old. It was normal for him to not know about such a thing. There are other realms connected to this living realm. The hell is one of them. The hell monsters are found in hell realm. So you somehow managed to change yourself into a hybrid hell monster? But why? Why? Do you even realize the power of a hell monster? Even ten hell monsters can take over this entire world as long as they are given a little time to grow. Not even your mighty dragons can understand in front of hell monsters. Aditya felt Lucas was purposely keeping the main point from him and that is the power of the hell monster. Looking at the withered dead bodies around Lucas, Aditya had some ideas about what a hell monster's power may be. Why are you doing this? I thought you wanted to surrender. Aditya had to keep asking questions. He can still sense a few other people on this island. Meaning that the evacuation process wasn't over yet. I wasn't planning on facing you here. The plan was to face you at the front line. But unexpectedly you managed to kill the Empire's strongest cultivator. I had to change my plans. Are you still mad about what I did to your son? If so, then you can take your son back. After all, I don't have any use for him. I have to waste my resources to feed him and keep him alive. Aditya's words had managed to anger Lucas. There was still some love for his son. Since you have taken my son, I am going to take the life of your wife in front of your own eyes. On hearing these words, he had to force himself to calm down. I already know that you're trying to buy time for those people to escape. Hearing this Aditya was surprised. He stopped walking around Lucas. A black greed sword appeared in thin air. While keeping his eyes on Aditya, he held the greed sword. No matter how far they far run, I am going to kill all of them including your dear wife. As long as I am alive, I won't let that happen. Aditya already had bought out the Adamantitium blade. Exclamation point. Exclamation point. Both men's weapons clashed in midair producing sparks of flame as a result. As their weapons clashed, both of them gained a little bit of insight into each other's strengths and powers. As he took a step back suddenly the ground beneath him cracked. From the cracks, 
Many black chains materialized and wrapped around Aditya's legs, pulling him down to the ground. He couldn't react in time to dodge the black chains that rose from the ground. As he was being pulled downwards, Aditya saw a grin on Lucas's face. Exclamation point. But that grin soon disappeared as numerous bolts of lightning bolts struck Lucas. Exclamation point. Meanwhile, just as Aditya's foot touched the ground, from the cracks, red magma started coming out. The magma easily destroyed the black chains and freed his legs. However, the very next second, the earth slightly trembled. Giant cracks spread everywhere. Piercing the thick blanket of snow, thousands of black chains rose from the ground. The size of the black chains was stronger than before. All chains had surrounded a detire. The black chains were made from dark element. This meant that these chains were much stronger than normal chains. Like snakes, the chains launched themselves at a detire. Annoying chains. A detire muttered as he tapped the ground beneath him with his right foot. The flow of magma coming from the cracks suddenly multiplied. Using his ability to manipulate magma, Aditya created a wave of magma. The magma easily destroyed the black chains. Exclamation point. Just as Aditya destroyed all of the black chains, Lucas appeared on his back. Aditya could feel the black great sword heading toward his neck. Exclamation point. Two lava hands rose from the magma under Aditya's foot and stopped the great sword. This left Lucas slightly surprised. The next second, he looked down and saw that magma was slowly covering his feet and trying to devour him. To Aditya's surprise, Lucas did nothing. The monster creepily smiled at Aditya while letting its body sink in magma. Something is wrong, Aditya became wary of what Lucas was doing to do. This wasn't the first time he had been deceived by his opponents. Instead of using his eyes, he decided to rely purely on his enhanced senses. And sure enough, just when he closed his eyes, there was no Lucas in front of him. Instead, Aditya found himself surrounded by more than 10,000 black chains. Lucas had managed to hide himself and the black chains using dark illusion. But the question is where is Lucas, no matter how much Aditya tried, he couldn't sense Lucas anywhere. It was highly unlikely that he would just flee when they had equal if not more strength and power than his opponent. This must be another trick or skill of his, Aditya thought as he spread his wings and flew up in the air. As he started flying, all of the black chains reacted 10,000 black chains launched at him. 10,000 black chains wrapped around Aditya's body. Exclamation point. He easily destroyed all of the annoying chains using Crimson Flame and then kept looking for Lucas. I am getting tired of this sneaky fight, before Aditya's battles used to be more direct and destructive in nature. But now he found himself facing an opponent who can move like an expert assassin. Someone who can hide his presence very well and attack without appearing in front of Aditya. He was clearly an expert at using dark magic. His opponent was also a master at using dark illusions. This was very troublesome for Aditya. Lucas did not cast an illusion on Aditya. Rather he perfectly used illusion to distort reality and used that perfectly with his other attacks making these attacks very deadly. If he wasn't cautious, he might get stabbed in the back. Aditya, can you guess where I am? Aditya tried to trace the voice and find Lucas's location. But he miserably failed to do so. He couldn't exactly tell from where the voice was coming. You can't find me, Dragon Monarch. Unless I want you to find me. Undead summoning. A small shadow materialized on the ground. In that split second, Aditya was able to sense Lucas's presence but that presence quickly faded away as the shadow disappeared. A large black magic circle appeared. Thousands of powerful undeads began to rise from the magic circle. As the undeads started appearing, they also brought a black miasma along with them. The black miasma started to spread around. These undeads are very strong, each of these undeads had a very strong dark aura. If I had holy magic, then everything would have been ten times easier. By now Lucas would have been dead, it was well known that, light counters shadow. Holy magic was the strongest weapon against dark magic. It was simply impossible for both holy magic and dark magic to exist together. In that case, let me show my elemental powers, 
a dit higher invested, 1000 plus, of his mana into his innate skill. Magma manipulation! Exclamation point. The snow rapidly began to melt while magma gushed out of the earth and took over the land. Meanwhile, everything was covered in black miasma. The sunlight was completely cut off, making the whole island feel as if it was a hunted place. Where are you? If the situation continued like this, a Aditya either would have to last long enough to force Lucas to come out of his hiding. And Aditya had no idea how long that would take. Who knows maybe Lucas can keep hiding for days or even months without needing to come out. Till he comes out of hiding, a Aditya would need to deal with sneaky attacks, black chains, and undeads. With a wave of his hand, a wave of magma devoured all of the undeads. A Aditya stopped flying around. He landed on the ground and waited for Lucas. And sure enough, as his feet touched the magma on which he had landed, another giant magic circle appeared beneath him. Exclamation point. This time, the magic circle summoned 100 giant black wolves. The wolves had red eyes and the wolves were two times bigger compared to normal magic wolves. Before the wolves could even come within his 10 meters radius, the magma started to devour them. Pathetic. Just as Aditya uttered this word, he suddenly felt a presence on his back. When he turned around, Lucas's aura disappeared. But Aditya didn't fail to see the small dark shadow that joined his own shadow. So just like Nathan, he can use shadow to travel and also hide himself in shadow, Nathan still can't do that latter one. This just goes to show just how proficient Lucas was at using dark magic. And Aditya had a feeling that this proficiency came naturally because he had turned himself into a hybrid hell monster. This time Aditya completely closed his eyes. He knew his real target was hiding in his shadow. Aditya ignored all other distractions and focused completely on Lucas. As for the other distractions that came in the form of black chains, undeads, and wolves all of them were devoured by magma. Ten seconds passed in silence and Aditya hadn't moved an inch. He continued to wait for Lucas with his eyes closed. Another ten seconds passed. The number of distractions that Lucas threw at him became much more frequent. Another ten seconds passed. Aditya faintly felt Lucas's aura in his shadow. The number of distractions that were thrown at him had almost tripled. Aditya could tell that with each passing second, this guy was becoming desperate. It was as if he wanted to distract Aditya so that he can come out of hiding. At the same time, Aditya moved the tips of his fingers and created a compressed crimson flame bullet which took no less than two seconds. On the 32nd second, Aditya finally felt Lucas's presence. Just as he felt Lucas's presence, he shot a small bullet-sized compressed crimson flame. Exclamation point. The compressed crimson flame bullet managed to hit Lucas. With the hit, Lucas's entire body appeared before Aditya. Ding. Crimson Corruption has been activated. With the activation of Crimson Corruption a red sparkling aura appeared around Lucas. Lucas grunted in pain. Ding. Crimson Corruption has inflicted bleeding effect on the target. For the next 5 seconds, the target will lose 3% of health. This curse effect can stack up to 3. In the next 2 seconds, a Aditya created 10 more of the compressed crimson flame bullets and shot them at Lucas who was lying in front of a Aditya. Exclamation point. A small groan escaped Lucas's mouth. He was in pain. Exclamation point. Ding. Crimson corruption has been activated. Ding. Crimson corruption has inflicted bleeding effect on the target. For the next 5 seconds, the target will lose 3% of health. Ding. Crimson Corruption has been activated. Ding. Crimson Corruption has inflicted bleeding effect on the target. For the next 5 seconds, the target will lose 3% of health. Exclamation point. Lucas didn't know what was going on but he could feel his health was rapidly dropping. Meanwhile. I have been waiting for this. Aditya grabbed Lucas's hair and pulled him up. Aditya was about to punch Lucas when he suddenly found his entire body frozen. His hands and legs were frozen. Other than his eyes, he couldn't move any parts of his body. And to his horror, he couldn't use his mana or any of his skills. 
Lucas freed himself from Aditya's grasp and then wiped the blood from the corner of his mouth. I have won. Chapter 394-394, Crimson Warlock vs. Dark Mage Sorcerer, I.I. Lucas freed himself from Aditya's grasp and then wiped the blood from the corner of his mouth. I have won. Aditya couldn't speak. He couldn't move his body. He couldn't manipulate mana inside his body. This meant that he can't use any of his skills. Through his eyes, he expressed anger and confusion while staring at Lucas. He wanted to know what this man had done to him and why he couldn't move his body anymore. I am not going to kill you now. As I said before I am going to kill your dear wife in front of your own eyes. Saying that Lucas turned around and began to walk away. Aditya stared at Lucas's back with his eyes wide open. His pupils were trembling. His crimson eyes were full of emotions. No, Aditya screamed in his mind. He tried whatever he could to make his body move. Watching Lucas leave, Aditya became more and more desperate. Move damn it. The dead images of his wives flashed before his eyes. He knew this was going to be the future of his wives and his people if he didn't move right now. Whatever it takes. Whatever sacrifice it requires him. Aditya wanted to stop Lucas. I said Moby E. Crack. Lucas who was 100 meters away from Aditya suddenly stopped walking as if he felt something. At the same time, Aditya felt the barrier that was preventing his body from moving shattering. No. It's impossible, unless his will is strong enough to overpower mine. Lucas turned around and watched in shock as Aditya broke free from his mind control. Mind control. Since Aditya is too strong, Lucas can never mind control him. He instead tried to paralyze him. But Aditya was able to break the dark spell with his strong will. As Aditya freed himself, the crimson lightning swimming at the clouds rumbled. Crimson lightning began to cover his entire body, forming a layer of lightning around his body. Meanwhile, Lucas knew that he was in trouble so he decided to go back into hiding and play it safe till he can find any weakness of his opponent. With the snap of his fingers, he created a 100 meters massive black magic circle. Undead summoning. As he summoned another wave of undeads in front of Aditya, Lucas slowly proceeded to sink into his shadow while staring at Aditya. This time you're not getting away. Aditya muttered these words while tapping the magma beneath him with his right foot. Lucas's entire body already had submerged into his shadow. Only his head and neck remained outside. Suddenly a rainbow color lightning bolt landed on Lucas's head. Boom. He was thrown out of his shadow. The rainbow lightning was 10,000 times stronger compared to a normal crimson lightning bolt. Enraged lightning spell. Meanwhile, a giant wave of lave rose in the air. The wave had reached a height of 30 meters. The lave wave easily devoured all of the undeads in an instant. Aditya didn't even bother to look at the undeads. TSK. It seems this time my attack failed to activate Crimson Corruption, Aditya hoped that Crimson Corruption would get activated. Once activated, on top of the damage that Lucas received from the Enraged Lightning spell, the Crimson Corruption would also put the Bleeding Curse on him once more. Swoosh. Within a few seconds, he appeared in front of Lucas who was lying on the ground and groaning in pain. Got anything else? Lucas had used many powerful abilities but failed to harm Aditya. When he did have the chance, he chose to not harm Aditya. He had wasted the golden opportunity that he got. Cough. Coughing out a large mouthful of blood, Lucas got on one knee and looked at Aditya with a grin. Well, I still have a few more. I am not going to wait till you use them. Saying that he severed Lucas's head. As he found himself flying in the air, he was confused. But then his eyes fell on his headless body. His head fell a few meters away from his body. You're not playing fair. That was the last thing that he said before he rolled his eyes and lost consciousness forever. Everything in a battle is fair. A Aditya would be an idiot if he took his time punishing Lucas or wasted his opportunity by talking with him. This was what Lucas did when he had the chance. A Aditya learned from Lucas and did not make the same mistake. Sigh. It's finally over. Aditya looked at Lucas's headless body that was still on his one knee. 
Looking at the headless corpse, he for some reason had an uneasy feeling in his heart. Let's burn this corpse to ashes. Aditya was about to burn the corpse with crimson flame when countless black tentacles rose from the ground and surrounded Aditya. What the? He couldn't even finish as he saw the headless body had begun to move. The headless body of Lucas moved like a zombie. What kind of monster is this? Aditya tried to fly away when he found one black tentacle wrapped around his leg. Even with his full strength, he couldn't free his head. The tentacle was preventing him from flying. Aditya's eyes fell on Lucas's body. The monster's body was moving very slowly. With slow and unbalanced steps, it moved towards Aditya. Even though fresh red blood was still dripping from his throat, the monster was still moving. At the same time, more black tentacles moved to grab Aditya's body. Suddenly his body started to change colors. His skin, hair, nails, hands, legs, and everything turned crimson. Ding. Crimson lightning blink. Ding. Using crimson lightning blink has increased your speed by 800 plus. Aditya turned into a bolt of crimson lightning. He easily tore the black tentacles. The headless body was hit with a powerful bolt of crimson lightning. Boom. The headless body was sent flying. When Aditya turned to his human form, he thought that the headless monster would be dead by now but contrary to his expectations, he saw the monster on his feet. The monster was still sloppily walking in his direction. Enraged lightning spell. A powerful rainbow color lightning bolt struck the headless monster's body. After the smoke was cleared, Aditya was shocked to find the monster was still on his feet. Even though by now, the monster's body had turned into a mess. Aditya could see his inner organs and bones. The monster was still walking towards him like before. Aditya, you can't kill this monster like this. What are you doing here? Aditya panicked. He looked at Alicia before looking at the headless monster. He was afraid that the monster would use this chance to take him. Aditya was also a little bit angry at her. I told you to take everyone away from here. Then why did you come here? Aditya did not hide his anger. Why can't she listen to his words? Listen to me. Without the hellfire, you can't defeat this monster. It was her words that turned his attention to her. Hellfire? A long time ago, our ancestors somehow managed to obtain the hellfire. The hellfire only exists in hell. It is the strongest weapon against hell monsters. Since then, anyone with Osborne family blood has possessed extraordinary fire affinity and the ability to use hellfire without even needing to use spells. Aditya was a little surprised. He didn't know about this. But this wasn't the time to talk about such things. So what should we do? Aditya asked while staring at the monster. You see all hell monsters desire to escape hell and come to this world. Even after death, these monsters do not wish to leave. This is why, even though Lucas is dead, his body is moving without any consciousness. In a way, the current Lucas had become something like a zombie or an undead or maybe a being that falls in between a zombie and an undead. He is already dead and his body moving like a mindless zombie. I will take things over. Just stand back. Today I get to take the spotlight from you. Hearing this Aditya smiled and then moved back. Hellfire. Alicia summoned a giant orb of golden flame. Looking at the golden flame, Aditya can tell that this flame wasn't any ordinary flame. At the same time, the appearance of the hellfire began to clear the black miasma that had covered the entire island. Looking at the golden flame, Aditya suddenly had an idea in his mind. Alicia, let's combine our flames. Alicia found the idea very tempting. She also wanted to see the end product of this. Alright. Aditya pointed his left palm toward the golden flame. The next second, a crimson flame from his palm started mixing with the golden flame. Undead both of their surprised eyes, the color of the flame started to change. The golden flame started to turn into a dark blue flame. The dark blue flame looked very majestic. Aditya and Alicia didn't even blink their eyes as if afraid the blue flame in front of them would disappear. The blue flame hit the headless monster. The monster's body instantly turned to ashes. Inside the flame, even those ashes had been broken into something extremely small. At the same time, 
The air around the entire island cleared up. The black miasma had completely disappeared. And peace had turned to the island. Ding. You have killed a peak 5 Thor to hell monster. Your experience points have been saved for future use. I think a future children will be born with the ability to control this magnificent looking dark blue flame. A detire broke the silence. He held Alicia from behind. Alicia smiled imagining her children using the dark blue flame. This dark blue flame would represent their union. The crimson flame and the golden flame would merge to become something much more beautiful. The dark blue flame will be a symbol of their union, love, and their bond. I love you. Alicia felt the need to say these words. I love you too. Alicia both of her cheeks and continued to hug her from behind. While enjoying the silence and the peace with her husband, her eyes looked around. Unfortunately, this battle had destroyed almost everything on this island. More than two stroke three of the total forest was totally gone. The whole of Blackburn village was destroyed. No houses were left standing. This place had turned into a barren wasteland. Our dream of making a wooden house on this island is over. Aditya tightened his hug and pulled her closer to comfort her in silence. Our presence on this island had taken away the ice elves' lives. We have destroyed the home. We have destroyed the land. We have destroyed everything that they held dear on this island. Alicia then turned around and deeply stared into his eyes. Aditya, you must find these elves a new place to settle down and provide them with all the necessary resources. Alicia had developed a sense of attachment to this island and its people after only spending a few hours touring around the island. Of course. Choosing this place for the meeting was a big mistake on our part. I can't return to their old life but I will help them find a new life. Hearing this Alicia smiled sweetly before hugging him. After a brief period of hugging each other, Alicia couldn't help but feel curious about the end result of this war. Lucas and all other emperors had died. Aditya and his allies can easily take over their territories. What are you going to do now? Alicia was talking about the end result of this war and what he was going to do next about this whole thing. Sigh. I don't know. Things went very differently than I had initially expected. Taking over all those territories would mean a lot of headaches and work was coming toward him. For the first time, Aditya didn't feel too happy about acquiring so much territory. Chapter 395-395, A New Era Begins. The surviving ice elves, accompanied by Aditya, Daxton, and their men, made their way toward Goldleaf City, the bustling metropolis that stood as a beacon of civilization on the mainland. For the ice elves, this marked their first foray into the vastness of a city, a stark contrast to the quiet solitude they had known all their lives on their secluded island. As they approached the city gates, a mixture of awe, excitement, and apprehension washed over the faces of the ice elves. Their eyes widened as they took in the sprawling streets filled with a diverse array of people, each bustling with their own purpose. The sounds of carriages, laughter, and animated conversations reached their ears, creating a symphony of urban life that they had only heard of in stories. Their gazes darted from one grand building to another, marveling at the architectural wonders that towered above them. The intricate carvings and embellishments on the facades of the structures captivated their attention, a testament to the craftsmanship and artistic prowess of the city's inhabitants. The ice elves, dressed in their traditional attire of white and blue, stood out amidst the vibrant tapestry of colors that adorned the streets. Their expressions held a mixture of curiosity, wonder, and a hint of trepidation. It was a sensory overload for them, as they had never experienced such a bustling environment before. Some of the ice elves clasped their hands tightly together, their grip offering a sense of reassurance and comfort amidst the unfamiliar surroundings. Others exchanged hesitant glances, seeking solace in the presence of their fellow elves who shared their awe and uncertainty. Aditya and Daxton, aware of the ice elves' unease, exchanged a brief glance, understanding the significance of this moment for their newfound allies. They approached the ice elves, offering warm smiles and words of encouragement, assuring them that they were not alone. Welcome to Goldleaf City, Aditya said, his voice filled with warmth. It may be overwhelming at first, but fear not. 
We are here with you, and we will guide you through this new world. Daxton added, his tone reassuring, you will find that the city is full of wonders and opportunities. Embrace the experience, and soon you will discover the beauty and vibrancy that lies within its heart. The ice elves, their expression softening, nodded in gratitude, their apprehension slowly giving way to a sense of trust and excitement. With the support of their leaders and the knowledge that they were not alone in this unfamiliar landscape, they took their first steps into the city, ready to explore the wonders that awaited them. As they immersed themselves in the bustling streets of Goldleaf City, their wide-eared expressions began to transform into ones of curiosity and fascination. They marveled at the bustling markets, the enchanting music that drifted from street performers, and the diverse cultures intermingling harmoniously. For the Ice Elves, this journey marked the beginning of a new chapter in their lives, filled with endless possibilities and discoveries. And as they ventured deeper into the city, they carried with them the hopes of their people, eager to embrace the mainland and forge new bonds that would shape the destiny of their kind. The meeting room, nestled within the heart of Goldleaf City, the capital of the Echo Dominion Empire, exuded an air of grandeur and power. The opulent chamber was adorned with intricate golden accents, reflecting the Empire's wealth and influence. The walls were draped in rich tapestries depicting scenes of victory and unity, serving as a constant reminder of the Empire's grand history. Tall, arched windows lined one side of the room, allowing sunlight to filter through and cast a warm glow upon the polished marble floor. The natural light danced upon the ornate chandeliers suspended from the high ceiling, casting shimmering patterns across the room. The chandeliers, crafted from exquisite crystals, sparkled with every movement, adding a touch of elegance to the surroundings. At the center of the room stood a long, mahogany table, polished to a lustrous sheen. It was adorned with intricately carved designs, showcasing the Empire's emblem and symbols of power. Surrounding the table were plush, high bat chairs, upholstered in luxurious fabrics of deep blue and gold, providing both comfort and regality to those who occupied them. At the head of the table sat Daxton, the Echo Dominion Emperor, his chair slightly larger and adorned with more elaborate embellishments, symbolizing his status as the host. To his right, Aditya, the Eisterian Emperor, commanded a seat of equal grandeur, embodying his importance in the negotiations. Alicia, the Goddess of Wealth, and Spencer, Aditya's trusted Prime Minister, occupied seats adjacent to their respective leaders, ready to lend their expertise and support. The room itself seemed to hold an air of reverence, its grandeur only matched by the weight of the decisions to be made within its walls. The echoes of past meetings, negotiations, and historic agreements seemed to reverberate through the room, infusing it with a sense of importance and gravitas. As the leaders convened around the table, their eyes cast upon the maps and documents before them, they were keenly aware of the significance of the room and the role they played in shaping the future of the northwestern region. The meeting room served as a symbolic backdrop, embodying the power and responsibility of those who sat within its confines. Together, in this majestic chamber, the fate of nations would be determined, alliances forged, and the path to a new era of unity and prosperity laid out. Alicia, the enchanting and shrewd goddess of wealth, joined the meeting, her presence commanding attention and respect. Aditya's trusted Prime Minister, Spencer, stood at his side, a pillar of unwavering loyalty and strategic acumen. Together, they formed a formidable team, ready to navigate the treacherous waters of territorial negotiations. Aditya leaned forward, his voice carrying an air of authority and conviction. We must acknowledge the undeniable truth, my esteemed allies and adversaries. The Eisterian Empire's intervention turned the tide of this war. Without our forces, the Echo Dominion Empire would have faced irrevocable losses. Therefore, it is only fair that we are awarded with a substantial portion of the territories. Daxton furrowed his brow, a mix of admiration and skepticism playing across his features. A detire, I concede that your empire's military prowess was a vital asset in this conflict. However, let us not discount the sacrifices made by the Echo Dominion Empire. We fought valiantly and endured immense hardships. I propose that the division of territories be based not solely on the military contribution but also on the potential for future stability and growth. 
Alicia, her gaze unwavering, interjected with a measured tone. Gentlemen, I have witnessed the ebb and flow of power throughout history. In my estimation, a fair division of territories must balance the need for justice with the imperative of ensuring economic prosperity. We must consider the resources, trade routes, and strategic advantages that each territory offers. Aditya nodded, acknowledging Alicia's astute perspective. You make a valid point, Alicia. It is crucial that we find a balance between honoring our respective contributions and paving the way for long-term stability. Let us proceed by sharing our preferences for territories, and through open dialogue, we shall strive to reach a fair and equitable agreement. Daxton leaned back, contemplating his words carefully before responding. I propose that the Echo Dominion Empire retains control over the territories bordering the Echo Nexus Empire, solidifying our influence in that region. In return, I suggest that the Eastern Empire lay claim to the western coastal areas, rich in resources and strategic importance. This division would provide both empires with significant advantages while maintaining a semblance of balance. Aditya's gaze intensified as he considered Daxton's proposition. Daxton. Your proposal holds merit, and I see the wisdom in it. If we divide the Echo Nexus Empire into three parts, the central, eastern, and western regions, I am content to take control of the western part. In doing so, the Eastern Empire can safeguard our interests while allowing the Echo Dominion Empire to consolidate its control over the central and eastern regions. Alicia, her voice a harmonious blend of authority and diplomacy, added her insights. I concur with Aditya's suggestion. By dividing the Echo Nexus Empire in such a manner, we can ensure a fair distribution of territories while fostering stability and cooperation. Furthermore, we should consider the inclusion of the Obi Islands, known for their Ethereum mines, under the control of the Eastern Empire. This would provide a valuable resource and contribute to the prosperity of both our empires. Daxton leaned forward, a thoughtful expression on his face. Aditya, Alicia, your arguments are compelling, and I recognize the benefits that this arrangement would bring. I accept your proposal, and I believe it sets the stage for a strong and mutually beneficial alliance. Aditya's eyes gleamed with a mixture of satisfaction and relief. Excellent. With this agreement, we lay the foundation for a future of peace and prosperity. Our empires shall unite in a bond forged by strength and understanding. As the negotiation progressed, the three leaders delved deeper into the specifics, debating the allocation of smaller territories, trade routes, and resource distribution. Alicia's shrewd insights helped steer the conversation towards a middle ground, ensuring that the interests of all parties were considered. Adam, a Dittire's father in law and a wise advisor from the Echo Dominion Empire, sat silently, observing the proceedings with a serene composure. He recognized the delicate balance that needed to be struck and trusted in the wisdom of the leaders gathered in the room. After hours of intense deliberation, a breakthrough was finally reached. The territories of the Echo Nexus Empire were divided as proposed, with the western coastal region falling under the control of the Eastern Empire, along with the coveted Obi Islands. The Anna Maria Islands, once under the governance of the Mystic Spring Empire, were to be ceded to the Echo Dominion Empire. The Catalina Islands, previously held by the Methia Empire, were granted to the Hephaestus Kingdom, offering them a chance at redemption and growth. The vast expanse of the Methia Empire's territories was also bestowed upon the Hephaestus Kingdom, allowing them the opportunity to restore order and prosperity to the war-torn lands. Daxton, filled with gratitude and awe, turned to Aditya. Your Majesty, I cannot express my gratitude enough. My empire owes its survival to your unwavering support. I humbly accept your gift of the Methia Empire and the trust you have placed in me. Aditya, his voice laced with sincerity, responded, Daxton, this is not a gift but a testament to our alliance. Your bravery and determination have earned the admiration of my empire. Together, we shall rebuild and forge a future of unparalleled prosperity. As the division of territories was finalized, a sense of relief washed over the room. The tense atmosphere gradually dissipated, replaced by an air of cautious optimism. The leaders had skillfully navigated a complex negotiation process, ensuring a fair distribution of power and resources. 
a detire leaned back in his chair, a mix of satisfaction and contemplation on his face. The new territories that would soon come under his empire's rule presented both opportunities and challenges. Rebuilding the Hephaestus kingdom, restoring peace, and developing the Western territories would require careful planning and collaboration with his allies. Daxton, his gaze fixed on the map of the newly defined territories, found himself filled with a renewed sense of purpose. The alliance forged between their empires held the promise of a brighter future, one where prosperity and security could be attained for their people. As the negotiation drew to a close, Aditya and Daxton shared a knowing glance, a silent acknowledgement of the weight that now rested upon their shoulders. Their empires, once at odds, now stood united in the pursuit of peace and prosperity. Daxton, a hint of admiration in his eyes, spoke first. Aditya, I must admit that I underestimated your strength and resolve. The Eastern Empire has proven its mettle on the battlefield and in these negotiations. We have much to learn from your leadership. Aditya, humbled by the recognition, nodded in appreciation. Thank you, Daxton. Our journey has been fraught with challenges, but together, we have overcome them. May our alliance serve as an example to future generations, showing that even in times of conflict, understanding, and cooperation can lead to a better world. And with that, the meeting concluded, leaving the room filled with a sense of hope and anticipation for the future of the Northwestern region. Chapter 396-396, Enchanted Elegance. As the meeting came to a close, Aditya graciously accepted Daxton's invitation to spend the night at the opulent royal palace. Currently, Aditya and Spencer found themselves engaged in an earnest discussion, with Alicia, Aditya's wife, enjoying a bath in the privacy of her chambers. Aditya, dressed in regal attire, donned a majestic robe of deep crimson, adorned with golden embroidery that traced intricate patterns along its edges. His presence exuded authority and power, befitting his role as the Emperor of the Eastern Empire. Beside him, Spencer, the Prime Minister, wore a tailored coat of midnight blue, accentuated with silver accents that shimmered under the moon's gentle glow. Their attire reflected their status and the grandeur of the occasion. The Ice Elves possess a spirit of resilience and selflessness that deserves recognition and protection, Spencer continued, his voice filled with admiration tinged with concern. Considering their background, I question whether the bustling city life will truly suit them. Perhaps it would be wiser to seek an alternative, such as relocating them to a more suitable island. Aditya nodded, acknowledging the validity of Spencer's observations. The welfare and adaptation of the Ice Elves were of utmost importance, and their well-being needed to be carefully considered. Determined to make an informed decision, Aditya made up his mind. Tomorrow, let us meet with Sam, the leader of the Ice Elven tribe, and discuss this matter further, Aditya proposed. I wish to hear his thoughts and consider the best course of action for their future. As they stood on the balcony, the starry night sky spread out above them like a breathtaking tapestry. Countless stars twinkled brightly, casting a serene and ethereal glow over the city. The air was still, allowing Aditya and Spencer to appreciate the beauty that unfolded before their eyes. Aditya noticed a sense of contemplation in Spencer's gaze as he stared into the vast expanse of the night sky. Something seemed to trouble his loyal advisor, as his focus appeared momentarily distant and preoccupied. Concerned, Aditya gently broke the silence, seeking to understand the cause of Spencer's unease. Spencer, what occupies your thoughts? Aditya's voice carried a note of genuine curiosity, his concern evident. Spencer's gaze shifted from the starry heavens to meet Aditya's eyes, his expression reflecting a mix of deep introspection and internal turmoil. He hesitated for a moment as if searching for the right words to convey his troubled state of mind. Your Majesty, forgive me, but I find myself troubled by an incident that unfolded during our escape from the small island, Spencer confessed, his voice tinged with a touch of vulnerability. Intrigued by Spencer's words, Aditya leaned in, his interest piqued. Please, share with me what happened. Taking a deep breath, Spencer began to recount the shaken event, his voice filled with sorrow and determination. Scene change. As chaos ensued on the island, with the urgent need to evacuate, 
Spencer, along with the ice elves and soldiers, raced towards the sea, their hearts pounding with a mixture of fear and determination. Amidst the flurry of desperate footsteps, Spencer's keen eyes caught sight of a familiar figure lying on the ground. It was Oriel Windrider, her delicate form marred by the injuries sustained in the explosion. While others hurried past her, Spencer's heart compelled him to pause and offer aid. Without a second thought, Spencer knelt beside Aria, his gaze filled with concern and compassion. Aria, unable to move due to her injuries, had resigned herself to the inevitable. Her expression conveyed a mixture of pain, vulnerability, and a flicker of surprise as Spencer appeared before her, offering a lifeline amidst the chaos. Are you all right? Spencer asked his voice filled with genuine worry as he assessed the extent of her injuries. The urgency of the situation faded momentarily as his attention focused solely on her well-being. Arya's cheeks flushed a rosy hue as she met Spencer's concerned gaze, her heart pounding with a mix of gratitude and admiration. Arya had a big crush on Spencer. Though her introverted nature and lack of experience in matters of the heart made it difficult for her to express herself. In this vulnerable moment, her admiration for him deepened, overwhelmed by his selflessness and the tenderness with which he approached her. I. I'm. I'm hurt, Arya stammered, her voice barely above a whisper, her eyes unable to meet Spencer's gaze directly. Her embarrassment heightened as he lifted her gently, cradling her in his arms with an instinctive care that spoke volumes of his nurturing nature. Unaware of his actions' effect on Arya's heart, Spencer focused solely on ensuring her safety. Don't worry, Arya. I'll carry you to safety, he reassured her, his voice carrying a warm and comforting tone. As Spencer carried Arya towards the shore, their steps became synchronized, their journey becoming an intertwining of destinies. The soft rustling of the wind mingled with the rhythm of their breathing, forging an unspoken connection between them. Arya's heart fluttered with every step, her admiration for Spencer blossoming into something deeper, something akin to love. As Spencer carried Arya in his arms, their eyes occasionally met, and a silent understanding passed between them. Arya's cheeks flushed with a mixture of embarrassment and affection, and she mustered the courage to break the silence. Spencer, thank you, for saving me, Arya whispered, her voice barely audible above the sounds of their hurried footsteps. Spencer glanced at her with a soft smile. It was the least I could do, Arya. I couldn't leave you behind. Arya's heart fluttered at his words, her admiration for him growing stronger with each passing moment. As Spencer swiftly carried Arya in his arms, their eyes occasionally met, exchanging and spoken emotions. Arya's heart pounded in her chest as she gazed at Spencer, her feelings for him growing with each passing moment. Spencer remained focused on their escape, his determination shining through. Arya's mind raced with a whirlwind of thoughts and emotions, but she couldn't find the words to express herself. She watched Spencer's every move, grateful for his strength and bravery. Her heart beat loudly in her ears, and her cheeks flushed crimson as her feelings for him deepened. Silence enveloped them as they navigated through the chaos of the island. Arya's gaze remained fixed on Spencer's determined face, unable to tear eyes away. She marveled at his selflessness, his unwavering commitment to protect others. Spencer, unaware of the torrent of emotions brewing within Arya, focused solely on their safety. His mind raced with thoughts of escape routes and ensuring Arya remained unharmed. Every step he took was fueled by his determination to see her safe. Arya's feelings for Spencer intensified with each passing second. Her admiration for him had grown into something more profound, something she struggled to put into words. Her heart danced with a mix of affection, longing, and a newfound vulnerability. As they finally reached the safety of the shore, Arya's mind was in a haze. She couldn't find the courage to speak, her emotions swirling within her like a tempest. The chaos around them seemed distant as she found solace in the warmth of Spencer's presence. Spencer, his focus finally shifting from their escape, noticed Arya's dazed expression. He met her gaze, his eyes searching for any signs of distress. Unbeknownst to him, Arya's heart was captivated by him, her face flushed with the intensity of her emotions. They stood in silence, 
the weight of unspoken words hanging in the air between them. Arya's heart yearned to express her feelings, but her voice failed her at that moment. She hoped that her gaze conveyed the depth of her affection, the unspoken truth lingering in her eyes. As Spencer carried Arya in his arms, her heart swelled with a realization she couldn't deny. I love him, Arya whispered softly to herself. The depth of her feelings for Spencer had taken hold of her, but her introverted nature made it difficult for her to vocalize those three simple words. Spencer's mind was consumed by thoughts of Arya, his heart and focus wavering during the lengthy meeting that seemed to stretch on endlessly. The Prime Minister of the Eisterin Empire was troubled by the intensity of his feelings. Since their encounter, his emotions had been in a constant state of unrest, tugging at his thoughts and distracting him from his duties. Upon hearing Spencer's confession, Aditya observed his friend's face intently. So, you're in love? He asked, his gaze steady and understanding. Spencer's eyes widened in surprise. Me? In love? He mirrored Aditya's astonishment, the realization sinking in slowly. Aditya turned his gaze towards the starry night sky, taking a moment before speaking again. Have you ever felt like this for any other girl in your life? His question hung in the air as Spencer shook his head, his attention fixed on Aditya's words. Let me ask you this, Spencer. Imagine if tomorrow Aria were to marry someone else because you hesitated. How would it feel to see her slip a ring onto another man's finger and share a kiss with him? Aditya's words pierced through Spencer's heart, stirring a storm of emotions within him. He looked troubled, his breath quickening. I don't want to lose her, Spencer replied, his voice filled with a profound sense of longing. This is love, Spencer, Aditya continued, his tone deep and contemplative. It is a double-edged sword, capable of either harming you or transforming you into a stronger and better person. Love has the power to rebuild and destroy, to give you purpose, ambition, and happiness. Life has presented you with an opportunity to create a family, to find fulfillment. Aditya placed his hand gently on Spencer's right shoulder, offering him a warm smile. In that moment, he wasn't speaking as the Eisterin Emperor bit as a true friend, genuinely invested in Spencer's happiness. It's time for you to discover a life beyond your work, Aditya advised his words resonating deeply within Spencer. The emotions in his heart grew stronger as he nodded in agreement. But according to the customs of the Ice Elven tribe, the tribe leader has the right to choose any woman from the tribe to marry. Sam's son has already chosen Arya, and he warned me to stay away from her, Spencer confided, his face displaying the conflict within him. Amidst the turmoil, Aditya erupted into laughter, surprising Spencer with his reaction. The Prime Minister looked perplexed, unable to fathom the reason behind Aditya's amusement. You're concerned about such trivial matters? Aditya chuckled his laughter echoing through the air. He reassured Spencer with unwavering confidence. Leave everything to me. It is the least I can do for my friend. With those words, Aditya left the balcony, knowing that Alicia would have finished her bath by now. Spencer smiled gratefully, feeling a weight lifted from his shoulders. He continued to gaze at the star-studded sky, a sense of hope and anticipation blooming within him. Thank you, my friend, Spencer whispered his gratitude filling his heart as he admired the captivating night sky, knowing that his path had been altered by the power of love. Scene change. Where have you been? As Aditya stepped into Alicia's lavishly adorned bedroom, his gaze immediately fell upon her. Two maids were attending to her, delicately assisting in the process of getting dressed. Alicia sat gracefully in front of an ornate mirror, the soft glow of candlelight casting an ethereal radiance upon her porcelain complexion. Draped across the room were exquisite silk fabrics, shimmering in various shades of gold and crimson, hinting at the opulence that surrounded them. The air was filled with the delicate fragrance of jasmine, a scent that seemed to perfectly complement Alicia's presence. Alicia herself was a vision of regal beauty, emanating an aura that captivated Aditya's attention. Her ebony locks cascaded down her back in elegant waves, accentuated by a jeweled hairpin that held a single crimson gem, reflecting the light and adding a touch of sophistication. Her attire was a work of art, a sakura pattern kimono carefully selected to highlight her grace and allure. 
The fabric flowed gracefully around her, its intricate patterns depicting blooming cherry blossoms, their delicate petals dancing across the silk canvas. Every stitch and brush stroke seemed to tell a story of beauty and nature's ephemeral wonders. Adorning her ears were crimson diamond-shaped earrings, their vibrant hue mirroring the blush that graced her cheeks. The gems twinkled as they caught the light, radiating a subtle, captivating brilliance that further enhanced Alicia's charm. As a detire took in the sight before him, he felt a rush of admiration and awe, realizing once again how fortunate he was to have Alicia as his wife. Her mere presence exuded elegance, grace, and a captivating allure that transcended mortal beauty. With each meticulous detail, from the delicate braiding of her hair to the choice of her kimono and the sparkling earrings, Alicia embodied a timeless enchantment, captivating the room and leaving Aditya momentarily breathless. My apologies for my delay, Aditya finally managed to speak, his voice filled with genuine admiration. You are a vision of extraordinary beauty, my love. Feeling Aditya's intense gaze upon her, Alicia couldn't help but blush, a small smile playing upon her lips, a reflection of her joy in being praised by him. You too may leave us, Aditya instructed the maids, who promptly bowed to Alicia before gracefully exiting the room. With their departure, a sense of intimacy and privacy enveloped the space. Unable to resist his emotions any longer, Aditya approached Alicia, enveloping her in a warm embrace. She appeared breathtakingly beautiful, her emerald eyes drawing his soul towards her in an irresistible manner. Aditya, please control yourself. We will be having dinner with His Majesty shortly, Alicia gently admonished, a soft smile gracing her lips. She welcomed his warmth but reminded him of the need for propriety. How can I resist? You are simply too radiant, Aditya confessed, pressing a gentle kiss to her nape. Aditya, please, not now, Alicia responded, her cheeks tinged with a charming blush. She averted her gaze, feeling a mix of embarrassment and longing. Undeterred, Aditya showered her cheeks and lips with affectionate kisses. Very well, my love. Let us proceed then, he said, extending his hand to her. Alicia, still blushing and with a sparkle in her eyes, placed her hand in his, allowing him to lead her toward the dining hall. The anticipation of the evening's festivities mingled with their shared affection, creating an enchanting atmosphere as they embarked on the next chapter of the night celebration. Chapter 397-397, A Day to Remember as Aditya and Alicia walked side by side towards the grand dining hall, the soft glow of chandeliers cast an elegant ambience. Aditya, with his regal attire, and Alicia, adorned in a stunning gown, attracted admiring glances from the palace staff they passed. Did you enjoy your day? Aditya inquired, his voice filled with genuine curiosity. Alicia's face lit up with a smile as she reminisced about the whirlwind of events that had unfolded within the span of just 24 hours. Today will be unforgettable for me. So many things happened, and I made countless new memories with you. Aditya's gaze softened, and a tender expression crossed his face. It won't be just today, he assured her, his voice carrying a promise of countless more cherished moments to come. In a brief pause, Aditya's thoughts shifted to a practical matter. By the way, now that the Eisterin Empire's territory has expanded even more, it's becoming increasingly challenging for Spencer to handle all the responsibilities alone. I believe it would be wise to find him a few capable assistants who can lend their support. Alicia nodded understandingly, her eyes glimmering with determination. Leave that to me. With my connections and influence spanning all six continents, I can easily find a few capable individuals who can assist Spencer in his duties. Within a few days, we'll have a team ready for him. Aditya's gratitude shone through his eyes as he gazed at Alicia. Thank you, my love. Alicia gently shook her head, a playful smile gracing her lips. Why are you thanking me? It's only natural for us to help each other and ensure the smooth functioning of our empire. Aditya nodded appreciating the depth of their partnership and shared responsibilities. With their hands entwined, they entered the opulent dining hall, ready to enjoy a sumptuous meal surrounded by the warmth of their love and the promising future that lay ahead. Emperor Daxton, seated at the head of the lavishly set table, exuded an air of regal authority. 
His attire befitted his position, as he wore a tailored midnight blue velvet robe adorned with intricate silver embroidery, symbolizing his sovereignty over the Echo Dominion Empire. The robe cascaded down his frame, its rich fabric flowing with every movement. As the centerpiece of the dining hall, the long table groaned under the weight of the culinary delights displayed upon it. The finest chefs from each region had meticulously prepared a feast that showcased the diverse flavors of the empire. The table was a tapestry of culinary wonders, adorned with dishes representing the northwestern, eastern, southern, and western regions. As Aditya and Alicia approached, Daxton's face lit up with a warm smile, a testament to his welcoming nature. Welcome, he greeted them, his voice carrying a hint of excitement and camaraderie. His presence radiated an aura of generosity and hospitality, befitting a ruler who sought to forge alliances and foster unity among nations. The dining hall itself exuded grandeur, with its high ceilings adorned with intricate chandeliers casting a soft, warm glow over the room. Luxurious tapestries depicting scenes from the Empire's history adorned the walls, adding a touch of historical significance to the atmosphere. Seated beside Emperor Daxton, Ice Elf and tribe leader Sam exuded a mix of relief and gratitude. His eyes sparkled with a newfound sense of hope as he exchanged warm glances with Daxton, indicating a fruitful and promising conversation that had taken place between them. Sam's attire reflected the natural aesthetics of his tribe, as he wore a finely crafted robe woven with delicate threads of ice blue silk. Intricate patterns reminiscent of frost adorned the garment, symbolizing the connection between the ice elven tribe and their icy homeland. Despite the simplicity of his attire, Sam carried an air of dignity and resilience, embodying the strength and spirit of his people. The smile on Sam's face spoke volumes about the outcome of their discussion. It was apparent that Daxton had not only offered the Ice Elven tribe a new home within his territory but had also pledged his support in providing essential resources, including food and other necessities. The tribe's plight had touched the Emperor's heart, and he had taken it upon himself to ensure their well-being. As they sat side by side, the camaraderie between Daxton and Sam was evident. Their shared vision of unity and compassion bridged the gap between their different worlds, fostering a sense of understanding and mutual respect. Daxton's actions demonstrated his commitment to being a benevolent ruler, extending a helping hand to those in need and creating a harmonious coexistence within his empire. Please have a seat, Emperor Ditai graciously gestured to Daxton and the others as they took their places around the long dining table. Alicia gracefully settled in beside Aditya, their connection evident in the affectionate glances they shared. Daxton, Noticing the absence of Spencer, couldn't contain his curiosity and inquired about his whereabouts. However, before Aditya could respond, Spencer arrived in time. With everyone gathered, Daxton signaled for Aditya to begin the meal, recognizing his honored status as a guest. Aditya, embodying regal elegance, skillfully cut into the succulent magic lion meat steak, savoring a small piece that he delicately placed in his mouth. Following the established noble etiquette of this world, the rest of the guests followed suit, allowing Aditya to initiate the feast. The table was adorned with an array of delectable dishes representing the various regions of the empire. Culinary delights from the northwestern, eastern, southern, and western territories were carefully arranged, showcasing the diverse flavors and culinary traditions within Daxton's empire. The tantalizing aromas wafted through the air, heightening the anticipation and setting the stage for a memorable dining experience. As each person indulged in the flavorsome feast, a harmonious atmosphere enveloped the dining hall. Conversations blossomed, filled with laughter, and the clinking of cutlery provided a cheerful backdrop to the shared enjoyment of the meal. Sam, there is something that I want to talk to you about. Curiosity took over the ice elven tribe leader and others sitting across the table. Sam. My Prime Minister has come to like a girl named Arya from your tribe. Spencer would like to marry her. Hearing this Sam was very surprised. Daxton didn't expect this development. So Spencer, is that true? The words of the Emperor were too surprising that Sam had to ask Spencer to be sure about it. Spencer seriously nodded his head. Then as the tribe leader, you two have my blessings. Hearing this Spencer smiled. Sam wasn't foolish. 
he saw this as an opportunity. By forging ties with the Prime Minister of the Eastern Empire, his tribe would receive so many kinds of benefits. This also would give them political powers and protection from others. After the conclusion of the dinner, Spencer excused himself from the table, his intentions clear to everyone present. It was evident that he had gone to seek out Arya and engage in a heartfelt conversation with her. His absence was met with understanding and asylum acknowledgement of the budding connection between the two. Aditya and Sam remained with Daxton, engaging in further discussions and solidifying the newly formed alliance between the Ice Elven tribe and the Eastern Empire. Their conversation delved into the intricacies of their cooperation, emphasizing the benefits and support that would be extended to the tribe under the Empire's patronage. Plans were made, promises exchanged, and a foundation for a prosperous future was laid. Meanwhile, Alicia, adorned in her Sakura pattern kimono, gracefully made her way back to her private chambers. She had important matters to attend to. As for Adian, the loss of his trusted Prime Minister had left an indelible mark on his heart. The weight of grief pressed heavily upon him, and he found solace in returning to the presence of his king. Adian did not join his allies for dinner. Everyone understood his pain and gave him some space. In the wake of the eventful evening, the palace settled into a serene calmness, each individual occupied with their respective tasks and emotions. The night carried on, enveloping the palace in its gentle embrace, as the destinies of these interconnected lives continued to unfold, guided by love, friendship, and the pursuit of a brighter future. As news of the defeat of the Echo Nexus Empire and its allies spread throughout the Echo Dominion Empire, a wave of jubilation swept across the land. The people, weary from years of conflict and strife, finally found reason to rejoice. The night sky became a canvas for colorful fireworks, illuminating the darkness with bursts of brilliance, mirroring the collective joy and relief that filled the hearts of the citizens. In the depths of rivers, the mermaids, known for their enchanting voices, joined together in a melodious chorus, their ethereal tunes resonating through the waters. Their song carried the message of victory, a harmonious celebration of triumph over adversity. The enchanting melodies reached the ears of all who inhabited the rivers and lived near the rivers, filling their hearts with hope and renewed determination. On the lands of the Echo Dominion Empire, the lion folks, known for their boisterous and jovial nature, raised their goblets high. They gathered in grand halls and taverns, clinking glasses together in a spirited toast. Laughter filled the air as they revealed in the defeat of their adversaries, savouring the sweet taste of victory as if it were the last night of revelry before the end of the world. The celebration spanned across cities and villages, unifying the people under the banner of triumph. Streets were adorned with colourful banners and decorations, and the air was filled with the contagious energy of merriment. Families and friends came together, embracing each other with joyous smiles and warm embraces, grateful for the newfound peace that awaited them. In this moment of collective celebration, the Echo Dominion Empire stood tall, its people united in the shared elation of victory. The echoes of their celebrations reverberated far and wide, a testament to their resilience and unwavering spirit. As the night unfolded, the festivities continued, a testament to the indomitable spirit of the Empire and the triumph of light over darkness.